Hello, everybody, and welcome back to KRS 421. Today's lecture is going to be on goniometry and neurological upper quarter screening. These are going to correlate with your first two lab assignments, uh, lab one and lab two, which should be due uh, within about the next week. So if we think about the different um, ranges of motion we find at the joints, we learned about this in chapter one, and then you'll find the information for each individual joint glenohumeral, uh, the elbow, then wrist, hand, and fingers in chapters 15, 16, 17. Um, so if we think about what creates range of motion or the angles, right, since we measure these in degrees with the goniometer, um, where does that range of motion come from? So first you have to start with the shape of the bones, uh, and that really dictates the baseline amount of range of motion that two bones have when they articulate. And then, um, you know, so we care about that total joint motion. So that's the arthrokinematics or the amount of motion at the joint. Then you also have to consider, you know, the passive and active structures. So the capsule, the ligaments, the flexibility of the muscles around the joint, because all of those things can affect uh, the total degrees you get when you measure with the goniometer, either actively or passively. So the key parts of the goniometer, so we have the stationary arm, and the moving arm with the fulcrum centered over the axis of rotation for whatever joint you're measuring. I know this is a picture of the knee and this is upper extremity, but uh, it's an easy example where we can see the stationary arm is lined up with the bony prominence, so the greater trochanter, the moving arm uh, going through the, the distal fibula. So we're measuring knee extension here in this example. Uh, so most of the time we're using these standard size goniometers. If you've shadowed in a clinic, you may have seen some of these smaller half sized ones. So these would be for like finger flexion and extension. Uh, and the smaller round ones that you see like here, um, we use those typically at the wrist or um, subtalar motion at the ankle. You may have also seen these on walls or um, at a, a PT clinic or a, a doctor's office where they have some type of protractor station. Um, when you're trying to measure <clears throat> the trunk, so she's measuring lateral trunk flexion here, um, don't forget that if you're measuring something like the glenohumeral joint, that's typically two bones, right? You're thinking about the humeral head on the scapular fossa. So when we're measuring something like trunk rotation, you have to think about the spine is multi-segmental. So even though you might get a single number for uh, you know, 40 degrees of lateral trunk flexion, that's actually multiple segments of the, the SI joint, the, the lumbar vertebrae, and even up into a little bit of the thoracic spine, even though you don't get a ton of motion in the thoracic spine. Um, so this is a multi-segmental measurement versus with a goni, we're typically trying to measure specifically between two bones. Oops clicking all over the place. Okay, so <laughs> um, why do we typically use a goniometer? Um, so from my experiences when I worked with physicians in doctor's offices or in the athletic training setting, hardly anyone uses a goniometer. Um, we just typically eyeball it because it's a lot faster. Um, typically physical therapists and occupational therapists, that's where you're really seeing people trying to do precise measurements. Um, especially if your patient's coming out of surgery. So you might find that a joint is swollen, so you have to measure how much they've lost. And then you can use that as a baseline measure to see how they progress over time, especially if they've had a recent immobilization. But remember if someone's been casted or splinted, that um, you are stabilizing it so that the bones can heal or the joint can heal. But by doing that, you really create a situation where if the joint isn't moving, the collagen fibers tend to stiffen up. Um, and so they might have really decreased range of motion in every plane at a joint. Like if um, the wrist has been immobilized after a fracture or dislocation, you're gonna be limited in flexion, extension, uh, ulnar and radial deviation, right? So regardless of what the, the injury pattern is, um, the immobilization process can really create a lot of stiffness at a joint. And then the last one is, muscle flexibility or tightness, what we call quote unquote a tight muscle. Um, so that's more of a flexibility issue. Okay, so remember range of motion is an arc that occurs between two bones that come together at a single joint or a series of joints like the example I used with the spine. 
we're always going to start in the anatomical position. There's a couple examples where you're using like a, an imaginary line of the body or uh, in space with the table or the lab. Um, but, you know, we're always starting at zero degrees, right? So when the joint is in zero degrees, that should be tied with our anatomical neutral or anatomical zero. Okay. Um, so you always want to make sure you're testing bilaterally and you're doing both active and passive, especially when you're first learning and you're trying to practice. Uh, the passive range of motion is very tricky because you're trying to not only move the segments, like the proximal and distal segments of the joint, uh, you're also trying to hold the goniometer and keep everything in line. Uh, so active range of motion is a lot easier because you just ask the patient to move it themselves. Okay, so if we think about the alignment, <clears throat> I mentioned that we're almost always using anatomical zero. So if you think about glenohumeral internal and external rotation, zero degrees would be this kind of green dotted line, right? So if the arm started here, anything this direction is internal rotation and anything moving posteriorly is external rotation. Remember that in this position, we're at 90 degrees of abduction. So zero degrees in the transverse plane is vertical, right? So here you're not, typically we think of uh, elbow at the side when you do internal and external rotation. Um, but if you were to abduct to 90, now you're still at zero degrees of internal and external rotation. You're just abducted 90 degrees. So if I move posteriorly, that's external and then internal, right? Um, so this is one of the examples of goniometry we use in a clinical setting in which we're not using kind of a, a anatomical position. We're still in zero degrees when we start, but um, since we're in 90 degrees of abduction in the frontal plane, uh, it, I don't want you guys to get confused or thrown off, right? Because this one's not starting in the anatomical position. But you're still in neutral, right? You're still at zero degrees in the uh, transverse plane. So here we can see the stationary arm is aligned with the table, right? So it's not going through a body segment. This one is horizontal with the table. Then the axis of rotation or the fulcrum should be, you're trying to shoot to the middle of the glenohumeral joint, right? So you're looking down the humerus and you're trying to think of, okay, what's a straight line through this humerus to the center of the glenohumeral joint? Because that's where the internal and external rotation is occurring. And then of course the moving arm with the long axis of the ulna, right? Because we're on the pinky side, so that's gonna be aligned with the ulna. This is another tricky one where um, we almost always start with the goniometer at zero degrees, but you can see this one, you're actually starting with a bent. So I'll try to zoom in. I don't know if you guys can see that mirrored or not. But if you look at the, the numbers on the protractor, it starts at 90, right? So when you're learning how to do goniometry, <clears throat> you always have to be careful to look at where your starting position is, and then you look at the number on the goni because there's three series of numbers. There's an inner one that's red, then there's the black one that's the traditional measure, and then on the outer ring there's another red measurement. And so you can see if that's at 90 degrees, the red number at the top actually says zero, right? So that's the number ring you would be looking at. Then you always have to start with, <clears throat> before you measure, um, for internal and external rotation of the shoulder, I would expect, especially if they were like an overhead athlete, let's say this is a baseball pitcher or a volleyball outside hitter, they might only have 40 degrees of internal. I'm guessing this is about 40. It's not completely bisecting the line. Like this line would be 45. So that's maybe like 35 degrees. Um, so if this person can only maximally go this far, they have 35 degrees of internal, we would expect um, maybe like 135 of external. So, you know, like the, the standard guideline is, you know, 80 to 80 or 90 to 90. Um, but depending on the, the unilateral dominance of an overhead athlete, these numbers might be different. Um, what else? Okay, the other thing to be careful of. Um, so as you start to go into max internal rotation, the tendency, so if you guys just internally rotate and you put your hand on your shoulder, the more you try to push into that internal rotation, the tendency is that you start to anteriorly tilt your scapula. So if we were gonna have this patient do active internal rotation, you have to be very careful that they're not doing anterior tilt of the scapula 
because that's creating extra motion, but it's not from the joint you're trying to measure. Right? So you always have to make sure that people aren't compensating or rotating at other joints um, to create what you think is more internal rotation, but it's actually anterior tilt of the scapula. Okay, so some common mistakes people always make, um, you know, you're busy looking at the stationary arm and the moving arm, and then your axis of rotation starts to drift. So once you think the person is at their end range, they're at the maximum position they can do, go back and double check, is my stationary arm aligned, is my axis in the right position, and then um, pull the goniometer away and then read the number, right? So just making sure that you're doing all these things really carefully. Okay, um, so for lab one range of motion, there's a bunch of links embedded into the lab assignment. So make sure you're watching those YouTube links. Um, and then, you know, we filmed one of them so you can see like the basic glenohumeral positions. That way when you're using the textbook to fill out your answers, you can have something to compare it to. Right, so you're going to need um, your textbook to fill out the lab sheet, and then the links are to help you um, visualize the motions as they're being produced. Okay, so lab one is goniometry and the typical ranges of motion. So it's going to be active, passive range of motion plus the infields at the end of the passive range. And then now we're going to transition and talk about lab two, neurology, and the upper quarter screen. Okay, so on chapter one, page 26, I believe. Uh, it's the, the neurology upper quarter screen. Um, so we're gonna be talking about the dermatomes, myotomes, and the reflexes. And then within that lab two, there's also good YouTube links that you guys can watch to supplement to see how we assess those things clinically. So remember with our upper quarter screen, we're talking about the two upper limbs. And we have to think about where information is moving up and down in the spinal cord. So um, the connection between the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system uh, is assessed with the upper quarter screen because all of the nerves supplying the upper extremity come from the brachial plexus, right? So here we see a diagram of the brachial plexus. Um, this is so I want you guys to think, is, the, is this the person's right arm or left arm? So I'll give you guys a minute to think about it. Is this diagram a right arm or is it a left arm? So if we think about the roots, so if you look at these numbers, those refer to the cervical spine and the thoracic, right, T1. If these are the most proximal points, this has to be a right arm because the terminal part goes out laterally. So this is a right arm. I think I said right or left. I don't know what I said the first time, but it's a right arm because the spinal cord is centrally. It moves laterally to the patient's right. So this is a right upper extremity example. Uh, of course, the left would be mirrored the opposite direction. Um, and then we always start at the roots. So root refers to where the nerves are leaving the spinal cord. If we just back up one, so let's say the vertebrae above this, right, we'll go back forward one, C5, right? So let's say the C5 vertebrae is here, and then just below that, we get the, um, the root. So remember, you have an anterior and posterior division from the spinal cord. Remember, um, the sensory afferent fibers are in the dorsal, and then the motor, ventral efferent fibers, right? Remember dorsal and ventral when we describe the spinal cord. Um, so those leave, you remember at this level, you have an inner vertebral foramen and that's where the root is leaving, right? So this thing is the nerve root. Typically we both have, um, you know, motor and sensory kind of shared on those same fibers. Okay, so RT, D, C, B. So uh, in the athletic training community, they always teach us real trainers drink cold beverages to describe this breakdown, right? So the roots come first, then the trunks, which are anatomical. So the roots are named for the spinal cord level. The trunks and divisions and cords are anatomical terms, right? So superior, middle, and inferior describe just where they're at anatomically, kind of in the, the neck area, the cervical area. Then the divisions 
anterior versus posterior, and then the chords. So these are more directional terms of where they're headed to. Then they, in, in the terminal branches, so B stands for the branches, um, people will also use it's the, the nomenclature terminal nerves, right? So terminal nerves versus terminal branches, those are used kind of interchangeably. Um, but the branches aren't only exclusive to being after the chords, right? So you can see like this one that drops posterior to the roots. Um, that's a very important nerve we'll, later, we'll learn later on. But that one's a terminal branch. It just happens to come off of the area of where the roots are at. Okay. So here we can see a left, right? This is the patient's left side because we have the, the nerve roots here before we get to, you know, R. So these are the trunks, and then you have the branches and cords, and then the terminal branches. So make sure you're reading page 517 and 518 to review and brachial plexus. So all the nerves that um, originate and supply the upper extremity are coming from the cervical spine. Remember, plexus just re refers to like a spider web looking network. So the things we're assessing with our upper quarter screen, so motor response, right? So how the nerves at each level of the spinal cord are making the muscles move. And we have our sensory. So the information that starts in the periphery, how does it travel back up to the brain through the, the brachial plexus? And then the last thing is reflex. Remember that's where we have um, a sensory stimulus that has a reflex in the spinal cord to create a motor signal that does not involve the brain, right? Remember a reflex is a motor response that skips the brain, so that synapse occurs in the spinal cord. Okay, so those are our myotomes, dermatomes, and reflexes, right? That one's easy. Okay, so for the dermatomes that we're learning about, so remember derma refers to the skin, so each patch of skin can be traced back to the nerve root in which those nerves are, are originating from, right? Before they head into the spinal cord and then up to the brain. Um, remember the, the sensory information starts, like if I scratch this part of my arm, let's say that's the, the C6 nerve root. Yeah, so this part of my thumb, uh, C6, right? So if I scratch my thumb, I'm stimulating the receptors to travel back up to that nerve root, right, C6. Then that information travels up the spinal cord through the brain into the, the sensory areas. Remember the, the precentral and postcentral gyrus, that's where all the, the sensory and motor signals are originating as they hit those neural pools, the gray matter in the brain, um, that help you make sense of things. And then, you know, the motor response comes down um, that postcentral gyrus. So if we think about each dermatone as a patch of skin. Um, this is just an example. Um, there's a lot of individual variation. Um, so not everyone is the exact same and there tends to be some overlap, which is why it's imperfect. But even if you don't know, like, oh, I think it's maybe C6, but it could be C7. In reality, it could be both. It could be just one or either. Um, but the important thing is when you recognize these signs and symptoms as being neurological in nature, that you would have to then refer them on to either like a neurologist or you know someone who's specialized in um, like a physiatrist is another option, uh, an MD or a doctor who can, can help determine what the, the root cause is. Um, so typically the next step would be like an MRI. Okay, so we said, and we just learned about those specific nerve root patterns. Right? So for the brachial plexus, it's typically the cervical roots. Uh, and remember the things that we generally have receptors for tend to be touch. So things versus, um, you know, light versus superficial versus deep pressure versus vibration. You have multiple types of receptors. Remember the Meisner's corpuscles, um, the Pacinians. You have all these different types of nerve endings that have receptors that you can tell the difference between something very light versus something that's like heavy pressure. Um, and then sharp versus dull, uh, and then some of the heat receptors, right? So those are just uh, a few of the basic sensations we feel in the skin that are normal. 
So the way we assess clinically, um, we'll usually grab a neurological tool. You can see this one has a pointy end that's very sharp. So you can assess um, how the sharp sensations affect each different pattern, as well as one that's kind of like a feather duster. So that's for a very light touch. Um, so you would just go through a pattern, right? We can start with C4, which is the upper chest, supraclavicular area. C5 crosses the elbow laterally. C6 comes down to the thumb. C7, we usually test the middle finger. There's some uh, variations in the C7 one. Some people think it's only this um, middle finger. And then the pinky for C8 and then T1, medial elbow. Uh, and then T2 coming up into like the axillary region. Um, so you would assess both sharp and dull. And then if the patient had any paresthesia, right, abnormal sensations, remember paresthesia would be things like burning, numbness, tingling. They might also complain of an inability to use the muscles. So there could be some myotome dysfunction. And also remember, um, you should be able to feel two distinct points as two, right? So another way we assess the dermatone pattern is through two-point discrimination. That means if I touch your patch of skin with two points, do you feel two points, right? Can you discriminate that it's two? People with abnormal uh, dermatone findings, they might feel two points is only one. Then they look at it and they're like, the sensation is one point, right? So this is one of the tools we use. You can see it starts with just a single point, and then it gets a little bit wider because normal is you should be able to feel two distinct points at about five millimeters distance, right? So if you grab this five millimeter edge of the tool and you touch the patient's skin, it should feel like two points. If they say one, that's an abnormal finding. Um, this one I find a lot of people struggle with that five millimeter. Um, just from the experiences in class, a lot of people can't get that, but that's not to say that there's something wrong. It just means there's not enough sensory cells in that area to be able to detect that it's two points. Okay, so here we can see all the myotome assessments. So we're performing a break test. So C4, we do a resisted scapular elevation, right? Resisted scapular elevation. We use the upper trap and the levator scap for that. C5 nerve root is abduction, so you're using the deltoids. C6 resisted elbow flexion, so bicep and the brachialis. C7 resisted elbow extension, so you're assessing the triceps. Thumb and pinky opposition for C8, so that's going to be opponent's pollicis of the thumb and opponent's digiti minimi of the pinky, right? So resisted opposition. Uh, and then the last one, T1, finger ABAD, right? So finger abdomen adduction, that occurs at your MCP, where the metacarpals meet the phalange, or where the fingers meet the hand. Okay, so those are all break tests, right? For the C4 to T1 uh, nerve roots. Okay, so for the reflexes, um, you have the biceps brachii, the brachioradialis, and the tricep. So that means at C4, C8, and T1, there is no reflex that we can assess. Um, so for um, the reflex assessment of the upper extremity, we have to rely on just C5, C6, and C7. In your lab sheet, you'll, saw, you'll find a link that has some really good, um, um, the YouTube example that we posted in the lab sheet is a really good example of what accurate tests look like. Um, like a word of caution when you're assessing your patient, the most important thing is that they're completely relaxed, right? So any type of muscle tension um, will really inhibit the ability to do the test accurately. So a lot of times we get, um, you know, false reports of hyporeflexia or diminished reflexes because the patient just can't relax. Like they think they're relaxed, but they're still creating some muscle tone. Uh, and you really have to work at these to get the patient to fully relax. Um, so each one's a little bit different. So when you're going through the lab, make sure you're paying attention to, you know, like with the bicep brachii, you're actually stri striking your own thumb as the clinician. You put your thumb on the tendon and then you're striking your thumb. 
versus the brachy, radi brachial radialis, you're assessing the tendon, you know, distally near the, the distal radius, and you're striking the tendon with the blunted edge of the hammer. Uh, and then the tricep, you know, you're holding and supporting the arm. So each position is a little bit different. So just make sure you're paying extra attention to those procedures. Okay, then we grade them. Uh, I, I don't know who came up with this skill, but normal, so like a slight twitch, right? If you're testing the bicep, you know, it's just a little flick, right? It's a very small um, reflex that occurs, and that's normal, which is a grade two. I guess they wanted to start with, if nothing happens, it's a zero. Um, but uh, a diminished reflex hypo, remember hypo remain, means diminished, is grade one. Grade two, we said it was normal. So increased, right? If they have hyperreflexia, if they jerk really quickly, um, that would be a grade three. And then hyperactive clonus, which is like an uncontrolled twitching, like a quick spasming and twitching, uh, is a grade four. Okay, so we've been talking about this brachial plexus, the myotomes, the dermatomes, and the spinal cord reflexes that are associated with the upper extremity. Um, the most common injury that we find in the brachial plexus is what's referred to as a, a burner or stinger. Some people will call it a neuropraxia, um, a brachial plexus injury. Uh, it's got a lot of different names. Uh, the lay terms stinger and burner refer, refer to the symptoms that the patient feels. Um, so typically when someone has a quote unquote brachial plexus burner, um, it feels like they have hot water poured down the arm and then they lose the ability to, to use the muscles. Um, so the, the things we're concerned with, the differential diagnosis would be cervical injury. So a, a sprain of the ligaments or strain of the muscles. And of course, a cervical fracture or dislocation is kind of the acute traumatic, very worrisome events. Okay. So the brachial plexus injuries are worsened by a stenosis. A stenosis is anywhere where there's like a circular hole, uh, typically in a bone, like a foramen, that ends up being too narrow. So that could be either the central canal of the spinal cord. Remember you have the vertebral arch. So this would be the posterior side of the body, the spinous process. Um, and then you have your vertebral disc and the body of the vertebrae in the front. And then the, the arch, which protects and supports the spinal cord. So it sits in this canal and the osteophytes or the little bony deposits that build up decrease the space, right? A stenosis is a narrowing or a decreasing of the space. Um, sometimes it's, it's congenital, they're just born that way where the, the opening is too small, or sometimes there's just uh, changes to the bony structure that it, it thickens or it becomes an osteophyte, or sometimes those are called bone spurs. Um, those can decrease the space as well. So remember the spinal cord will transition to the intervertebral foramen where the nerves are leaving through the roots, right? So the roots lead through the intervertebral foramen where two vertebrae stack together, you get a hole in the bone and that opening in the intervertebral foramen between two vertebrae, uh, that can narrow as well. So that would be like a nerve root impingement. Uh, of course, you guys have probably heard of a herniated disc or a nerve root impingement. So if this disc starts to slide out of place, it'll you know drift and then pinch where that nerve is leaving the spinal cord. Okay, so all those things can create um, increased risk of, you know, um, burner stingers and, and upper extremity brachial plexus pathology. Uh, here we see a very detailed MRI. We can see the spinal cord in yellow. We see a flattening of this cervical disc. You can see some of the osteophytes in the cervical spine that are pinching on the spinal cord. Um, and you know, that's what creates those nerve root impingements or um, the stenosis that um, puts pressure on the spinal cord and the patient will feel um, the dermatomes or myotome patterns being affected. Uh, so these posteriorly are the spinous process that are sticking out. So these kind of lines are the spinous process. And then you see the vertebral bodies that are kind of this orangish color. And then the green is the inner vertebral discs. You see the cerebrum, cerebellum, you know, the midbrain, pons medulla, all those good structures. Okay. Um, so acutely, the brachial plexus can be injured from either a traction injury. So you can imagine the head 
is going the opposite direction. The shoulder gets pushed down and then we get stretching, right? Traction refers to a stretching of the brachial plexus. Uh, nerves do not like to be overstretched and it's typically the lateral and posterior cord. So that's why people struggle with um, abduction and flexion of the shoulder, right? Because the lateral and posterior cord um, is the, the deltoids and then uh, biceps. Uh, the other option that could occur is on this side of the picture, you could get a compression, right? So if the head is being tilted to the side, uh, we could get a compression that would be on this patient's left side as well. Okay, so paresthesia, body posture, those are all important things when you're recognizing uh, and talking to a patient with uh, a brachial plexus injury that occurs acutely because they'll, they'll be running off the field and their arm will just be dangling because the muscles stop working. So there's a decrease in the myotome function. So we kind of already talked about that, how the lateral and posterior cord are the most affected, just anatomically, they're the ones that get um, overstretched. So the body posture would be the arm is just dangling at their side. They complain of a burning, numbness, tingling, shooting pain, uh, and then the, the Superclavicular, the lateral deltoid, feels like someone poured hot water down their arm, and it may even extend like all the way down to the thumb um, because that's the C6. Okay, last little part here. Um, so, our circulatory exam. So, I know we've only been talking about um, goniometry and the upper quarter screen. It's also important to denote changes in circulation. Um, so, distally in the capillary beds, remember we have capillary refill, where if you pinch the nail bed, squeeze all the blood out and release it. The red color should return in one to two seconds. Um, so you're denoting capillary refill distally. Uh, the radial pulse, uh, remember that's gonna be just medial to the radius. So that's the picture you see here. And then the brachial pulse. So if you push kind of right near your elbow joint, the way I always find mine. Um, so I find kind of where my bicep tendon crosses the elbow joint. And I push kind of under it and towards the, the humerus. And you should be able to feel the brachial artery kind of right in that area as it's getting close to crossing. But you got to make sure you're kind of above your tricep muscles and below the bicep and the brachialis. Because remember, it's kind of like right in the middle. All right, so that's gonna wrap up um, goniometry and the upper quarter screen and circulatory exam for chapter one. And then it extends into you know, 15, 16, and 17, right? So make sure you're getting labs one and two completed and I'll see you guys next time for chapter three.